าจริงจริงค่ะว่าฉันมาจากประเทศอังกฤษและรัสเมียสเดนิชและเราอยู่ในบ้านของโคเปนเฮเกนกันร่วมกันและเราคิดว่าชีวิตเราเป็นแบบนี้ว่ามันเป็นแบบที่ง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่ายและง่า And grow, and you know, see what we were capable of, and uh, that definitely happened. So we had been talking even since we first met about like creating this place where people could come from all over the world, and we could host events and just uh, do cool things. And we found this castle, and I just felt this big connection to it, and I was like, we have to do this, right? And we did. <laughs> and it, then our life was no longer easy or perfect or boring. It was just like a complete. So the highs are so high, and the lows have been so low. Yeah, we basically chose to step out of the comfort zone in a sense. You know, Denmark is a really good system. You have everything taken care of. You don't really have to worry about many things. But. I have a background as an architect, and I always wanted to, like, to to create a like a, a little world or a little a little structure and a system for people to explore how how good life can be. And we also explored like how good it is, but also how how intense it can be. So the ups and downs is, is definitely part of the the experience. But we kind of said yes to life, and we got more in both ends. So it's. Uh, It's 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 really it's a, it's a life changing experience already in three years in. So, but we're surrounded with like like we got spring water in the taps. We got like these old forests that like the monks took care of like a thousand years ago, and they did agriculture in in the ways we we want to go back to. Like we have this vision of like going back to the future, kind of like taking modern technologies, but like without everything. You don't really want like all the, all these like processed foods and all the pesticides and all these things that we've gone too far and used. We kind of want to just take a step back and do it in a new way. So we're doing a regenerative agriculture here and like doing all kind of like CO two storing methods for the the, pl the flowers to grow well and like permaculture and all our products is like as pure as they can get. Pretty much, we just add nature and. In bottles and jars, and uh, <laughs> let the nature do the rest. It's, it knows very well how to do it, so we just let it play out. So.
It's great. And that's part of the reason why we wanted this type of lifestyle is because we were living in an apartment in Copenhagen and it was, you know, it was really hard to get outside. We're going up and down five flights of stairs with kids and just to get outside. It was a public park. We didn't have any of our own space outside. And we, it was so nice once we moved here, they were two years and six months old and they just had free range of, of anything, you know, they, it was amazing to see like the freedom that they had without having to worry about cars or people or anything around that they could just live their life. And it's been really cool to, you know, study insect with them and teach them how to plant the garden and which plants can you eat in the forest and you can't and how to crack the nuts and they just soak up all that information and it's really cool to, to see them like learn those things that they have access to as in a city life. Really. Yeah. That's yeah. We had, the, we had the choice when they were very young to be like, should we just go for it and like have them on this adventure. And one of the priorities for us was for them to have like, their foundation in in nature, like just like go out, play in the dirt, get all the bacteria in their system. Like, don't be afraid of like things. Like, they see thorns and bees, and sometimes they come running back. Oh, look at this! And they found like a dead mouse, or they're like, they're they're <laughs> they're reference to things like they saw. We we're like walking in the city, and they saw like the the hexagon shape. And they're like, oh, did the bees build that? And I was like, yeah, we're winning. You know, we're like, <laughs> the, re the reference of things is amazing. And I think to have that base and have those just like grown up here with like that space in your mind and like the, yeah, everything will we'll give them a base. So if we only give them the first seven years here, they still have that base. You know, if we go back to an apartment now or whatever happens, they will always have this uh, the childhood so if yeah if we can give them that that's kind of the that was the main main goal basically and then if they if we're here in 50 years that's also our motto if things are going up or down it's like yeah 50 more years and then we just we keep yeah. going and if i can leave this castle as an architect if i can build this so you have everything you need here like abundance of food that's grown itself and a castle paid off and still have spring water in the taps and like then then it's good you know yeah then the kids over that i know they're they're gonna have a good life here so i probably want to yeah, run off and live in new york or some nice city they're gonna want to go to the city <laughs> <laughs> yeah Not <laughs> bad. It's um. So we weren't prepared at all, really, when we came. We didn't know any Italian at all. Yeah. And you know, people. That's one thing that that's good about us, but it's also bad. Maybe it's like we just jump right in, and it's not like, oh, we need to do this first, and we have to learn Italian, and we need to like meet people and know all these things about agriculture and study olive trees or tourism or anything. We didn't do any of that. We just came <laughs> here and we, we learned it all here very quickly, except the Italian part. We're still <laughs> not really learning that, but we have so many other things to focus on that it's like, it's very hard. Plus all of our clientele are um, English thinking. So sure. we don't really have any clients. We, we learn what we need to learn. It's not like tourist Italian. No. We, we learn like lenzuola, like something like sheets and towels and water heater and wrench, like all these kind of weird, we have a weird vocabulary, I think. 
legal, some legal uh, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to all these. Uh, One of the reasons that we haven't had time to learn Italian is because within the first year of us being here, you know, things were going great. We were busy and stressed, but they were fine, you know, and we had a lot of business. Um, so uh, then there was an accident and there were like down the hill, someone smelled gas. So I went to check it out and uh, the gas smell was very strong and I didn't know what to do. Everything looked right as far as I knew. So I shut the door and I walked out and a few steps after me walking out, that room exploded and I was fire and it was yeah, as awful as you can imagine. Um, yeah, it's like right over, right down there. And yeah, I someone threw a bucket on me and I went to the shower and just stood in freezing cold water and like, but I thought I was dead at first, like, And then I realized I wasn't. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally fine then. <laughs> like, my brain completely switched to being like, okay, I'm dead. And that was it. And I'm really sad that I, like, didn't write my book. And I didn't. But at least my kids weren't here with me. So I'm, like, dying alone. And they're fine. So whatever. And then once I realized I could stand up and actually walk, I was like, okay, well, this is fine. I'll be fine. I'll be back to work tonight. Like no big deal. Um, but I was not fine. <laughs> and, uh, I like all this skin on my hands and my arms were gone and on my face, um, and my feet. And then I was in, after that I went in an ambulance and then I, they put me in a coma and I didn't wake up for another week, but I oh wish I goodness. had not. I really like, I mean, I'm glad I woke up eventually, but I, when I woke up was a, a billion times worse than like the actual, like being on fire was because it was just like, it was torture. I was in so much pain for one, like physical pain. And then I had this emotional torment happening where I was on morphine And I didn't know what was real and what was fake. And I had these incredibly strong visions or dreams that my kids were outside my window, which I didn't even have a window that looked to the outside. And they were screaming for me. They were naked. They were covered in poop. They only had like cheese, like Cheetos to eat. And they're like, mommy, mommy. I'm like, why won't anyone let me help them? And the other really awful one was I... I saw Rasmus cheating on me with all the nurses, like in my room, <laughs> while in a coma. And I just, I, oh, it man. feels so real still. Like when you have a dream, you know, you're like, oh, I kind of remember this about it. But it was real to me. And so we had to go through that too, because then when he really did come, To visit me I would be like what are you doing here we're getting a divorce and I would call people and be like don't talk to Rasmus he's gone crazy <laughs> he's an awful person and you know I never want to talk to him again and I need to get my kids passports and we need to get out of here and so that wasn't good and yeah how did you feel about that <laughs> yeah I the part doesn't really that's not the traumatic part for me to be accused of something I I didn't <laughs> remember doing or didn't do you know so but it's, it's like seeing it seeing seeing it from the outside just go to the hospital and yeah it was um, traumatic to see because you know the little bag with the wedding ring that they They took off in the little biohazard pack and I came in and there are tubes in the mouth and the whole face was swollen and the lips was black because they're like burned and it would bleed every time I would make her laugh and 
it was, I was like, it was so frustrating. I couldn't be funny or like yeah. Well, it hurt. Everything just hurt so much. It was absolutely miserable, and I couldn't communicate at all with the the hospital staff. No one spoke English. A few nurses did, but they weren't always with me. It was very rare. So I couldn't communicate my needs. And that's when I started to learn, you know, like the words for bedpan and diaper. Like, you know, that's the Italian that I learned was and pain and Dolores. elbow and all these, like wherever I was feeling pain, I started to learn. And I wanted like, okay, well, I'm going to be useful while I'm in the hospital, you know, and then I'll learn Italian and it's like, you can't really be useful in that state. And that was really difficult for me to understand because I'm the type of person who always has to be productive. And like, I can't just watch a show. I'm like, I'm also going to be doing something over here. And like, it's very hard for me to just sit and do nothing. And that's what I had to do. And I had to depend on everyone else to do everything for me. I could not move. So I could not use the toilet. And uh, I could not bathe myself. I could not feed myself. Uh, I couldn't do anything for months. And when I finally did get out of the hospital, like, I still couldn't do those things. So Rasmus would have to, like, lower me down to the toilet and help me back off and help me to bed. And it was just awful. And I didn't see my kids for, like, two months because I was in isolation. Because if I got an infection... I could die. So I didn't even get to see them. And then when I did see them, I looked completely different because I was bandaged up and bloody. I mean, the scars, luckily, like you can't really tell on my face anymore. But on the rest of my body, uh, it's pretty much covered in scars uh, because they took the skin off my legs to put on my arms and hands and face. When Rasmus would drive me two hours each way to the hospital to get my bandages changed, and that, that was the torture. Everything was just torture. And in all of that, like during it, we had to make the decision of, so what do I want to do when I get out of the hospital? You know, I want to go back to the castle. Do I want to keep going on that dream? Because like this happened less than a year when we were here when we left our boring, perfect, happy life to come here. And it's like, should we just go back now and give up on everything? And I didn't want to do that because it just felt like we were getting so close to what we really wanted in life. So, okay, let's fight for it. So I started making sales calls from the hospital and I was emailing with one finger that had that wasn't bandaged and I was typing like, yes, oh yeah, we would love to host your wedding here and everything is perfect and your wedding will be perfect. And meanwhile, like I, I, I can't do anything except that. And we, and it, it worked. I worked really hard and I redid the website and I redid packages and we were fully booked for 2020 and my goal was 20 wedding for 2020 and we exceeded that goal and we were fully booked and we were about to have an amazing year. And then uh, COVID came and we had nothing. All of the events got canceled except for very few and some postponed, but you're still not getting any money when that happens. And you're trying to figure out how to hang on through Potentially, I mean, it's looking like the same is going to happen for 21. So that's why we were trying to do like uh, other ideas and trying to do the products, the farm. I fought so hard already and uh, to do it again, it's really difficult to fight back and like change again. Like, okay, adapt, 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 like.
Yeah, we can book events, but the problem is people getting here right now. You know, there's a lot of travel restrictions still. So, okay. Yep. Yep. Do you have the product online? We have our um, olive oil. It's the best olive oil you can find. The olive oil, if you haven't tried olive oil that goes straight straight from the olive into the bottle this is this is really good there's some good stuff yeah olive oil yeah, and honey honey was really good we have uh pure raw honey we have about 100 beehives Pretty much. We have uh, really cool people coming here to help out. We have like a, a volunteer program where people come from all over, yeah, wherever they can arrive from and they, they help out here. Okay. And we have uh, some cool guys helping out to run the, the farm part of it. The so. outside part, yeah. And when we have events, like obviously we need more people on staff, but right now it's pretty slow. We're just okay. spending all of the time in the garden, which is really nice. Yeah, I think we're still figuring that out too. But one of the things that helps me is to say, okay, um, make a decision and then make it the right one. Because, like, we made the decision to come here. So we have to keep fighting to make it the right one. I mean, I'm not saying, like, we'll never give up or whatever if, like, things keep happening. But it's like, okay, we made this decision. We wanted this for some reason. So look back on those reasons. What were they? What brought us here? And what do we love about this decision? Why are we happy that we made it? Instead of just focusing on, oh, our life could be so much better if we did this or if we did this. And it's like, no, this is the, what we chose and we need to make it the, the right for us um, somehow. Yeah, also like, our logo kind of is kind of like it's a key and it's like earning and learning and giving and basically that that's our vision it's not so much about us like when when we're in trouble it, it kind of hurts because we, we we get in trouble but it's also i mean are we changing the world are we doing something good here and that's so it's it's not just about us it's more about the vision of what we can bring to the world and I think right now the world needs a place like this where there is good energy and there is uh, good food and there is like the, the hope you know people are sitting at home and they they want to get out and explore things and if we can somehow be a beacon of hope or or create a way of, of living that's inspiring for others and like if we believe that we're making a little difference, it makes it easier for us to to keep going instead of being focused on our own kind of pain. You know, it's more like okay, we're of service to to somebody else. Hopefully, we can inspire people. And what can you do to make the world a better place? And if you know you're doing that, you can you can you can get far. You know, yeah. if you focus on your own little ah. Uh, then it's, it's hard. So. And how I got through those times in the hospital where I really just had wished that I had died for a lot of it um, was to just accept that my life wasn't going to go back to the way it was because that, that was so painful to just keep replaying like, I'll never walk again or I'll never do yoga or I'll never ride a bike or I'll never be able to pick up my children. Like your brain keeps going to these places and the, having these awful thoughts that you can you have to push past and push through and accept like if that does happen, that's okay. What do I really want in life the most is just to be outside with my family. And if I can do that, then life is worth living. 
so that that's all I wanted and that's what I continue to focus on like daily it's like what did I want in those moments it was to be outside with my family so let's go outside and be together and I I can walk now and I can ride a bike and do yoga after a lot of work um but yeah to just sit there and focus and 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 think that things will never change for you. Like you can't get through a, um, a trial that way. You really have to kind of accept and move forward and then focus on one small thing at a time. I had a, a list that my mom and I wrote on when I was in the hospital, like I can feed myself a grape. Like, and that was a huge deal. And that that's not a huge deal to like most people. Or I could write my name, and you know, and then they just kept getting, you know, bigger and bigger. But still, those things to everyday people are not big at all. They do them every day, all day. And do you ever, like, go to the bathroom and say, like, thank God I can use a toilet? I'm so happy. <laughs> and it's been years for me, and I still every time I use the toilet, I'm just like. I was so happy I used the toilet. <laughs> Wipe myself. Like, wow. I don't have to depend on anyone for anything. But if I need to, I have people in my life that I can. And that's the important thing. Thank you.